we have an advantage in photography today with digital, is that we can produce a better black and white image today than we could ever produce with film. Now that is a hellacious statement, and I'm gonna show you. The difference, and I will f defend your choice for this to the death, is aesthetic. If you like the metallic quality of silver paper, that is the justification reason as to which one would make one better than the other. But from a numeric standpoint, from what it is that you can do standpoint, I, I believe as a black and white, traditional black and white photographer, that um, we can do better today than we could ever back in my day. Okay, so the, the title of this presentation is Somewhere Over the Chromatic Rainbow. It was gonna be called Somewhere Over the Chromatic Rainbow Following the RGB Road, but I didn't think that that was a good <laughs> pun, but didn't make any sense. So it's a black and white of seeing, shooting, and post-processing black and white and infrared digital images. So these are three quotes that I basically run my life by. I run my life by many quotes, but these three in particular. A simple plainness is the most difficult thing to achieve. Thinking should be done before and after, not during photographing. And if you're not willing to see more than is visible, you won't see anything. This particularly applies to digital infrared. So the through line of this presentation is gonna be based off of those three quotes. So here are my five eternal questions that I always get. First, did you see the photograph in black and white? What makes a good black and white photograph? When did you know the picture was going to be a black and white? How come my black and white photographs don't look as good as your black and white photographs? And can you teach me how to see the photograph in black and white? I will, I will answer all these questions and I will use good words and I mean really good words and the words I use will be good. Words, sorry. That will be my only political. Okay, question one. Did you see the photograph in black and white? Okay. First what we need to do is we need to define what a black and white image is. We have to come up with a definition that we all agree on. Okay. So let's take a look at that. The world of film is an LAB world. And what that means is that it works in the way of human perception. Digital is an RGB world, which is different than LAB. And what the difference is, is that LAB is logarithmic, therefore nonlinear. RGB is linear and therefore non-logarithmic. That's hard to say fast. What does that mean? Okay, we'll get that in a second. In the world of ink and paper, black and white literally means black ink, white paper. So what we have is we have a difference in terminology. So it's important in art to be precise. The reason being, I'll give you an example. Sir, do you like red or blue? Do you like red as well? So the answer is yes. Okay, so what happened is you answered the question you perceived you heard, which was, which one do you like better? Okay, so in art, one needs to be precise because two plus two can equal fish. So in the digital world, gray is composed of equal values of red, green, and blue. And what that means is gray is a color. If I move the green just by three points, I have a gray green. It's certainly not gray. It may be a neutral gray, but that's certainly not gray. So what the heck does that mean? Human perception is logarithmic, therefore nonlinear. And what that means is this. If I have a cup of coffee, and I put a packet of sugar in this coffee, it will taste sweet. If I put two packets of sugar in this coffee, to human perception, it will not taste twice as sweet. It will merely, merely taste sweeter. That's logarithmic if, and nonlinear. If we were in an RGB world, it would be twice as sweet. This difference is profoundly important when it comes to digital infrared. 
So the reason why I don't refer to my images as black and white images is because they're not black and white images, they're color images. At no time do I ever leave the RGB color space and at no time do I not print using all the inks. I am printing a color image that is of the monochrome gray which is made up of equal values of red, green, and blue. So if somebody ever tells you in a black and white seminar that color doesn't matter, do this. <laughs> color matters. Now, let's take a look at the definition of a chromatic grayscale. It will have a black, in this case black of ink, a white, in this case white of paper, a middle gray, which is made up of equal values of red, green, and blue, 128 red, 128 green, 128 blue, and a grayscale ramp from black of ink to white of paper. Do we all agree? Okay. So, a white, a middle gray, a black, a grayscale ramp, and we will agree that these colors are all different. Okay, this is 255, 255, 255 RGB, and this is 100% cyan, yellow, magenta. If I remove all of the color out of the image through global desaturation, what I will get is this. That's evil, isn't it? I've just lost two-thirds of the relational data of the file in an RGB world by removing all the color out. Obviously, this is something we don't want, correct? Somebody's been in my class before. No, why? This is predictable. I can predict that it will do this. Now, what that means is that I can control it. What film was able to do versus digital is if I had a red and a blue that were the same luminance, or a yellow and a pink flower that were the same luminance, same brightness, film would record those as two different grays. If I removed all the color out of an RGB digital capture, they would be the same gray. At first blush, that seems like something you don't want. I want that logarithmic thing. The problem with the logarithmic thing is that this is the L channel, the L star channel, luminance, which by our definition, as did this, this also met our definition, right? A black, a white, a gray, and a grayscale ramp in between. Okay, how many wine, uh, wine drinkers do I have in here? <laughs> Bottle of wine is 80% water, 10 to 17% 10 to alcohol, 5% malic acid, citric acid, tartric acid, sugars, tannins, bug parts, schmutz stuff, things. 2 to 3% diffused aromatic gas. It is a 2 to 3% diffused aromatic gas that gives the wine 100% of its flavor. What I'm going to discuss is a theory that will give you the 2 to 3% control that gives the image 100% of its oomph. Because every one of those pictures that you saw in that slideshow were all color. They started out as color, and the infrared started out as color infrared. Okay, so which color space you want to work in, LAB or RGB? Let's find out. RGB because it's predictable. This is the red channel. Is this by our definition black and white, chromatic grayscale? Is this the green channel by our definition, chromatic grayscale? Is this by our definition, chromatic grayscale? All three of these are different interpretations of the same image structure, but they are all different. And you can see them and you can decide, I like the creaminess of this more than I like this, but I like the redness of the lips more than I like this. I like the darkness of this area more than I like this, and I like the detail here. The way that film worked, so you see now I'm getting serious. You can always tell somebody, glasses come off. Do this. <laughs> Ever since I got these like big ass, did I say ass, I'm sorry. These big glasses, um, I always feel very professorial. Um, the way that film worked is something called a tonal reproduction curve. And tonal reproduction curves were balanced to different ways of the visible spectrum frequency. So you would use different films for different things. 
What we can do now in digital is we can make image specific tonal reproduction curves that are image structure specific. And this is my theory. How many people use Nick software, Silver Effects Pro? Okay, so the conversation we're gonna have, so you understand from where I come from with this. I was the second employee of Nick software. I was the photographer that was used to wrap around the plugins. I was the guy that got to help and say, this goes here and this is a, particularly that plugin. Black and white to me is my life. So what I want you to see is the predictability of this. This is important because let's look at lab. Is there anything that you can figure out here to use? Is there anything here? The only useful information is L-star luminance. Okay, and this is the traditional way that many photographers will do a black and white conversion. The classic black and white conversion is go to lab space, drop A star, B star, convert to grayscale, then go back to RGB. All you do is dump two thirds of your data and give yourself the same headroom. The, worse than desaturation. So not something you would want to consider. But film is the way in which it works. So, This is the color image that you see at the moment of capture, okay? This is the final chromatic grayscale image. You have to have this so that you can get this. Now, the tonal reproduction curve that produced this image is that. Do you see color that way? No. You see color this way, unless you're in the movie Twilight, in which case, and I suspect <laughs> you're hungry and that's the way you would see color, you don't see color this way. But it took this color to produce that image. Okay, the problem with the way in which we teach and learn um, chromatic grayscale or black and white is that we see things from the top down, not the bottom up. Here, you can tell I went to grad school already. The philosopher Kierkegaard said, right? When you whip out Kierkegaard, you go, somebody has too much education. <laughs> said, we live life forward, but frequently we experience it backward. When you describe a situation, you don't describe the orders that it went this way, you describe backwards. Oh, he kissed her, and then she, he looked at her first, and he was all shy. Right? You don't go, he was so shy and then he looked at her and kissed her. You don't describe it that way. You describe it the other way. It's like a Golden Gate Bridge, rainbow in the fog. What happens is the sun hits the bridge, the rainbow occurs, the fog moves in, the clouds part. That's how it happened. How you would describe it is, oh my God, I saw the Golden Gate Bridge, the rainbow, the, the sun hit the bridge. It's like you go backwards. Okay. Problem is that when we look at a black and white image, we look at it from the top down. Color doesn't matter. If we look at it from the bottom up, color completely matters. Complete ownership of color in a chromatic grayscale image is a success, is where you will find success in making the images that you fell in love with, which were black and white. That's what all of us fell in love with, right? You took one black and white image, you said that. I want to be able to do that. Okay, so the answer is no, I saw the image in color. Okay. So here's the takeaway. A chromatic grayscale is an image, is not an afterthought, it's the only thought. It's not something that you go, oh, it didn't work in color. Well, what if I take the color out and make it black and white and call it art? Because it looks weird. No, it just looks weird. Next, before you can have a great chromatic grayscale image, you need to have a great color image. Let's go back to film days. You had a film camera. You put black and white film in the camera. You close the the back of the camera. You look through the viewfinder. You saw the picture in color. Doesn't that trip you out? You're taking black and white pictures, but what are you seeing? You're making decisions based off what you see. So you have to have a great color image. Now, the conversion to chromatic grayscale is of the very last, if not the very last thing that you do. It is not the very first thing you do in post-processing in the journey to print. So doing a conversion, in my humble opinion, is not something that should occur in a raw processor. 
because you do not have the control that you need to be able to nuance the image, to have total control of individual image structure to make total controlled TRCs, tonal reproduction curves. So it's the last thing. The, the, the step before that is midtone contouring for print. Okay. So if you see the image in color, you captured the image in color, ultimately you will be printing it in color, even though the image will be monochromatic grayscale ramp from black to white. You don't want to go to just the black inks. You want to fire all the heads, because that gives you the most beautiful transitions. And that's the way printers, modern printers today are developed. So let's move to question two. What makes a good black and white photograph? What do you think makes a good chromatic grayscale photograph? Smart. Contrast. Contrast. How about this one? <laughs> How about a good color photograph? OK. All the things that make a great color photograph are all the things that make a great chromatic grayscale image. This is where I'm going to speak a little heresy. Yes, you're going to hate me. Yes, you'll be resistant, but it will be OK. I have a 12-step program for this. <laughs> um, OK, so let's take a look at, this is a color photograph. Cool color photograph, right? That's the black and white version of it. I needed a great color photograph to be able to make a great black and white photograph. I needed a great color photograph to be able to make a great black and white photograph. Again, I needed a great color photograph to make an even better chromatic grayscale photograph. OK. So I always get, this is my favorite question I always get asked. It's like people asking me what f-stop, which I've never understood. So what f-stop do you shoot that at? Five six? Oh, is that your favorite f-stop? Well, we've been dating for a while. Uh, <laughs> but I'm beginning to see f8. There, there's just more depth there. Um, yes, I'm into puns. I'm really sorry. No, I'm not. No. OK. When did you know it was going to be a, black, a great black and white photograph? Come on, there you go. To know when an image is going to make a great chromatic grayscale image, you have to understand what makes a great color image. And what makes a great color image is this. And I preface what I'm about to say is I am merely an acolyte to this man, the great photographer, Jay Maisel, who I am blessed to have as my mentor, says, according to him, there are, there are three elements in a photograph that are important. Light, gesture, and color. Light and color are obvious, but it is gesture that is the most important. Because I can't leave well enough alone. You've spent enough time with me now to know that I can't leave well enough alone. I have light, gesture, color, and timelessness. So let's take a look at light and color. These are obvious, right? Light, color. You can't miss them. But it is gesture that is the most important. It is gesture that is the most telling. <laughs> you get this, right? This hits you over that my niece hates this, too. OK, so what's timelessness? Timelessness is when you catch a moment in between moments. Like there's an arc, so you're like, Let's use a wave as an example. A wave moves forward, a wave moves back. There's a moment where the wave has ceased moving forward, but it has not started moving back. Because I like to make fancy words up, I refer to that as temporal apogee. OK. What century did I shoot this? What century did I shoot this? What century did I shoot this? I could have shot this yesterday. I could have shot it 50 years ago. That's timeless. If you can get timeless in a photograph where the when is impossible to put your finger on, one of the first things that I've learned about timeless is that timeless in a city occurs four stories and above. 
the age of a city is at four stories above. Go walk on the street in New York, because New, New York and Paris are the best examples of this. All the banners and all the nonsense and all the neon and all the modern stores and all the new cars are where? From the bottom of the, th the, third, the fourth floor down. If you shoot from the top of the fourth floor up, down, up, what happens is you shoot past modern and what you get is era. So, when do you know the picture is going to be a black and white? In every instance, the image tells me at the moment the picture takes me. And there's a conceptualization difference I'd like you to consider. I want you to stop taking photographs. Oh, my work's done here. <laughs> I want you to be taken by your photograph, OK? That second quote, the time to be thinking about the photograph is before and after, not in the middle of it. Let the photograph rip you through the lens. And if it pulls you strong enough, that means that the gesture is strong enough. And if the gesture is strong enough, the color of the image becomes a distraction to the gesture of the image. And that is the answer to what makes a great chromatic grayscale image, that the color gets in the way of the gesture. So your only choice is to remove the distraction of the color so that the abstraction of the gesture remains. Because it's the story, it's the moment, it's a thing that tugs you. Now, Steve, are you here? Steven? In Glima? Yeah. I owe you a, debit, a gratitude of thanks, even though you are a cannon shooter. Um, no, we had a conversation where we were comparing war stories about girlfriends. It was really funny. The first time we met was in a bar because we showed up a half an hour early to some event. And I'm a Nikon guy, NPS, you know. And he was CPS, you know. And we're sitting there like, you know. Bye. And we got to talking. And at the end of it, thick as thieves friends. And one of the greatest insights in black and white I got from him. Do you know why black and white is compelling to you? Think about when you see it as a species. When do you see in black and white? At night, right? OK, because color, the, the cones go away, and you're just using rods. Now, at a reptile brain level, we know that there are beings and creatures in the night that see better at night that can eat us. OK, so when we see black and white images in daylight where we're seeing in color, attacks a part of us that is vulnerable. It opens us up to a place in ourselves in which we are looking at something we're not supposed to see. Now, from a monetary standpoint, to quote um, Oscar Wilde, amateurs speak in terms of art, artists speak in terms of money. The main reason why I do a lot of black and white is it goes with everything. It does not matter what the furniture is. <laughs> OK, so the bottom line is the image will always let you know when it wants to be a chromatic grayscale image. Why? Because the gesture is so absolutely strong. You look at it, and the color is just, it's got to go. OK, the big one. And here's the offer I put, because if you really want to know how to do this, I wrote a book on it. I make $2.50 profit on the book. You buy the book, I will give you the $2.50 profit I make. <laughs> I'm not trying you to get you to buy my book. My email is vincent at versacephotography.com. I will be more than happy to if you say, hey, you know, you, you stole my $2.50. OK, comes down to, how come my black and white photographs don't look as good as your black and white photographs? Simple. Because until this moment, most likely, because the way black and white photography is taught 99% of the time, you're told that color doesn't matter. You just need a lot of contrast of light and dark. You heard how that was said here, values, contrast, light and dark. No. You need a great photograph. And the photograph's gesture has to be so powerful that you just suck the color out of it because it gets in the way. Question five. Can you teach me how to see in black and white? OK. 
This is the final chromatic grayscale image. Because you see this way, you don't see this way. So can I teach you to see a photograph in black and white? You tell me. No. What I can teach you to do is I can teach you to see a great photograph. Okay. What can and should be taught is how to see a photograph and how to be taken photograph, not take the photograph. This ends the chromatic grayscale portion of this presentation. Next up, infrared. Now, I'm going to go quick through this because I did an hour and a half tutorial that BNH has on um, my black and white infrared conversion theory. And the URL is as long as the tutorial. <laughs> So take a picture of the URL, or just type in Versace IR BNH, and it will take you there. Everybody got that? OK. This part of the tutorial is entitled, In the Heat of the Light, Coming to Therms with Digital Infrared. <laughs> Nothing like a good pun. <laughs> OK. Then when you take any seminar or workshop with me, this, this is very important. Everything I write has precedence in truth. OK. Albert Einstein said, all the 50 years of conscious brooding have brought me no closer to the question, what is light? Of course, today, every rascal thinks he knows the answer, but he is deluding himself. Now, if Einstein didn't have a clue, as to what light is. What makes you think anybody else does? For example, light is both a particle and a wave at the same time. So what that means is it's something else. So it works in two different ways at the same time. So let's take a look at some of the most common things we know. The most common way that light is produced is from something hot. This is known as black body radiation. Now, there are many other ways we can create black or light, you know, microwaves, electronics. But for what we're dealing with, it's through heat. More than half the energy from the sun, a really, 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 really big thermonuclear device, arrives to our planet in infrared radiation. The part of the spectrum that is referred to as infrared is frequently broken into two parts, near infrared and far infrared. It is the near infrared that matters to us. Near infrared is a part of the spectrum that is used in infrared photography and ranges from about 700 nanometers to about 900 nanometers. Far infrared wavelengths range from about 1,000 nanometers to 15 micrometers and is the range used for thermal imaging. To be able to do that type of photography means you, need, you have to refrigerate the um, sensor. You have to cool it. Okay. Let's look at this. I'm sure we've all seen this a billion times, right? But it, this is what we see. That's this. That's infrared. So there's more infrared than there is visible spectrum. As a matter of fact, a digital sensor is better at capturing infrared than it is at capturing visible light. Here's where the CCD starts. Here's where the CCD ends. What's happened is a dark mirror is put in front to block this out so that you just see that part of the spectrum. So if we look at this in comparison, do you see how much more that the sensor actually, it's a better infrared capture device than it is a visible spectrum device. Now, this is what happens with infrared. This is the same camera. Same lens, one modified for infrared, one visible spectrum. What do you not see in this photograph here that you do see here? Details. Details. And this, his prayers being sent off to the Buddha, or the coating that gets rid of all lens flare isn't designed to get rid of infrared lens flare. And so what I get is bonus so that you can see things that's just on the other side of perception. And what's really, really important to keep in mind is that you're not photographing heat. You're photographing the outcome 
of light caused by heat. That infrared doesn't photograph heat. Same girl, same camera, same lens. Look at the difference. Okay? Same location. Now, what happens is different fabrics reflect infrared differently. Same girl, one infrared, one visible spectrum. Same location, same camera, just one's modified for infrared. All right, so although there are other ways to create light other than heat, the light we are photographing when capturing a digital infrared image is caused by heat. However, it is not the heat of the light. See, here's where, see how I brought that back? See? It's not the heat of the light that you are photographing, it's the light caused by the outcome of heat, which is why we're gonna to come to therms with this. <laughs> Your light meter is balanced to expose for visible spectrum. Why trees, tree leaves and plants photograph white in infrared capture is because chlorophyll and xylophyll, particularly xylophyll, what causes trees and leaves to appear green does not absorb infrared radiation, which means that it's, if it's not being absorbed, it's being reflected. And if it's being reflected, the sensor picks it up just like a negative, and the more photons that hit the sensor, the whiter that is. Infrared light focuses at a slightly different focus point than visible spectrum light. Now, this is important with regard to capture. Either you do it in live view, which is focusing right off the sensor, which will guarantee you in focus, or when you send in the camera for conversion, you ask them to modify the sensor, put it back, for infrared focus. I would recommend that you do that. That's what I've done to my cameras. Now, let's take a look at this. This, this is very important with regard to infrared. Okay, this is set to monochrome. This is as shot processed in Nikon View NX, NX2 Nikon D. This is white balanced. This is what a properly white balanced infrared should look like. This is frequently what it comes out, out of the camera. Okay. This is the visible spectrum. Now, because this is green, my meter is balanced for this. Gives me a perfect exposure, right? Problem is, it's blown out here. I have to be 2.3 stops underexposed for my visible spectrum to be able to get proper exposure for my infrared. So in this instance, that which you're taught not to do, chimping, you know where that comes from, the term chimping? Um, the first Olympics that was shot with Nikon D1X, there were uh, several photographers, one of which is actually here, who shall remain nameless. Um, and don't tell Kevin I told him <laughs> about this. Was one of the photographers underneath the tennis um, stands, and they were looking at their pictures in the back of the camera, and they're going, ooh, 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 ooh. So all the other shooters called them chimps. Okay, so let's compare faux infrared post capture conversions because I always get, well, can't you do it in post processing? No. Here's why this is an as shot, properly white balanced. This is the visible spectrum of the colors. Okay, this is as shot white balanced capture NX done to black and white. This is using the channel mixer preset. What do you see different? Just because I can turn green white means I turn red black. Okay, this is the comparison. This is the black and white adjustment layer. Not, the black and white adjustment layer does not even agree with the channel mixer. So you have two different things. You see how that one becomes black, that one becomes gray? Okay, um, this is Silver Effects Pro. I wouldn't recommend using it for infrared. What I would recommend you do is convert the camera, bite the bullet, go to life pixel. It really comes down to two conversions that I would recommend. If you shoot a lot of people, do the super enhanced color. If you shoot a lot of landscape, do the enhanced color. The more megapixels you can have, the better off you are. Because what happens is the red and the blue channel tends to call the difference in this. Green contains luminance, and what's occurring is that you're blocking out a vast majority of the green data. So you're more reliant on red and blue. So the more pixels you have, the better off you are. So if you're not sure, okay, use your second camera from back in the day. But if once you get hooked, which everybody I know that ever shot infrared does, um, I have a 36 megapixel camera that I've modified to infrared. And when we 
when Nikon in the future, which I'm sure they will, because that's the way we go, makes a bigger megapixel camera, I will go there for that. Okay, let's look at as shot white balance capture between the two. See this? This is polyester, all of this. Polyester photographs differently because of the way in which it reflects light than cotton. But we agree that that's black, we agree that this is red, and we agree that the undergarment here is black. Notice that this is basically all light grays because it's reflecting the light. It's not reflecting the heat, it's just reflecting infrared because polyester does not absorb infrared. So this is visible spectrum IR channel preset. Do you see how profoundly different that is? This is the um, black and white adjustment layer in either Lightroom or Photoshop. And this is global desaturation. In this instance, global desaturation actually gets you closer. All right, so here's the conclusion. That just because you can turn green to white in software doesn't mean that you, you that means that you make red to black. That just because it appears to be DRAC, okay, we missed that one, um, to be a dark color in the visible part of the spectrum does not mean that it will photograph dark in the infrared part of the spectrum. You have to pay attention to it. Dyed hair photographs differently than natural hair. So you can, all sorts of things change because it's out of the visible spectrum, so they don't pay attention to that part of it. If you're going to shoot infrared, you do. Now, I'm a classicist. My friend Jack Davis, you know, he does the, that, that color infrared stuff. Me, all infrared must be black and white. Well, I don't know why, but that's, that's just the rule. No, but you can also do color infrared too, which is interesting. I just, this is for black and white infrared. That you cannot realistically create or replicate an infrared image from a visible spectrum image. It, it just, it's too much work and you lose something. Okay, now the difference between film and digital is film requires that it be stored in a refrigerator both before being shot and after or it will fog. Must be loaded and unloaded in a light tight changing bag or in a completely dark room. Requires filters on the lens for best effect. Needs to be manually focused to a different focus point than visible spectrum. Older lenses had that red dot on it Remember? That was for infrared. Okay, so, oops, did I skip one? Yeah, we're back. All right, here's the big one. Um, infrared film's no longer manufactured. <laughs> well, I, I guess we don't need to bother with the rest of them then, do we? Okay. Um, so I guess that answers that question. Is film infrared better than digital infrared? <laughs> digital infrared's alive. <laughs> it's on this side of the grass. Um, doesn't, the beauty of digital infrared doesn't need to be stored in a refrigerator. You can shoot at 1,000 ISO. You don't need a filter. You can see through the viewfinder. Um, you can modify the camera to focus. Um, you have, I, I shoot at 6,400 ISO. You can do all sorts of stuff with it. So the conclusion is, if you take the metallic qualities of silver paper out of the equation, um, and comparing apples to apples, digital infrared is a better all-around proposition than film photography is. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.